All right, this video is going to be a little longer because I'm trying to going to try to wrap up the rest of Russia here in one video. So bear with me. All right, so Russia's going to try to reform. First of all, look at that mustache. That is an amazing mustache. Look at the curls. Amazing. Okay, but Russia's going to try to do some reforms. So, Tsar Alexander II, who's going to get the nickname the Tsar Emancipator, and that might give you an idea of what he's famous for, is finally going to end serfdom in Russia. He's going to end the feudal system. So he gives the serfs their freedom. Yay! Which is a good thing, right? He ends the feudal system. And it's about time, because feudalism had died out hundreds of years earlier everywhere else in Europe. But while he gives them freedom, he doesn't give them any money. All right, so now all these people who were living on land, you know, that was owned by lords and had nothing. They, the lords are still there. They still have their titles and everything. They still own all the land. Um, now all the serfs are free, but they don't have any money. They don't have they don't own anything. Everything they owned, all the tools they used, everything was owned by the Lord. They were basically owned by the Lord up until this moment of freedom. And so now with Tsar, the Tsar Emancipator, Tsar Alexander II, gives them their freedom. He doesn't give them any money. He doesn't give them the ability to, you know, become free citizens. And so they're poor. And what do they do? Well, they basically go back to work for the former lords. Um, and sharecropping develops. This is the same thing you see in the United States of America in the southern states uh, after slavery ends where poor African Americans and poor whites uh, were basically forced into feudalism or serfdom again, except now it's under the veil of freedom and uh, we call it sharecropping. Or basically you go into debt to the whoever owns the land, you do all the work and they get to share in the profit. And they usually take the bigger share, whoever owns the land does. Anyway, so he tries this stuff, and it's going to be largely a failure. He will create some interesting uh, local government things called Zemstavos. Um, these actually kind of exist in Saudi Arabia today, so in a way of like history repeating itself. Um, Russia's still a monarchy, so top-down government and the, you know, the czar, their king, has total say over everything that goes on in the country. Saudi Arabia today is the same way. They have a uh, monarchy. Uh, and that's kind of rare in the modern world, but they still have a monarchy. Well, very similar, both countries uh, developed local government authorities. So in Russia, Zemstavos were basically um, a local government group, usually run by older people, who would uh, be able to have some say in like where roads were going to be developed or if they should build a bridge and stuff like that. But they had no real higher powers. They couldn't control tax policies. They weren't able to affect the, the government of Russia as a whole. Right, that was all out of their hands. That was all held by the Tsar. But they will allow, allow for some local control. So Alexander II is trying to make some reforms. You know, he ends serfdom. He gives some local control. He's trying his best. He is going to encourage some industrial growth, but it's going to be led by the government. Whereas you see in England, in the United States of America, in France, in Germany, the industrial development might be um, sponsored or supported by the government. Uh, it's largely created and drawn by private citizens you know you've probably heard of john d rockefeller and you know carnegie people like this vanderbilt these wealthy people um who were private citizens these weren't lords or thomas edison these weren't lords or anything like that these were just regular everyday people who had ideas or had the ability to uh fund their industrial desires and so these individuals were going to were spearheading the industrialization and growing things in russia it's different in russia the government's going to try to build all the factories and the government's going to try to build the industries and they're they're going to you know push their version of what should be created and that's not necessarily a free market and it's not it's, it's not necessarily a good way to run an economy or grow industrialization um, and how are they doing this, too? They're building all these factories not because there's a desire for industrial goods in Russia. One of the problems Russia had is that Russian peasants didn't desire uh, industrial goods as much as uh, other people in other parts of the world. Uh, and so the government's building things and the government's buying all these factories and building all these factories and they're just going into monstrous amount of debt. All right, They have no middle class, they have no consumer class, and so they're just going into debt building these factories for really no reason. Uh, but he, you know, he's trying. <laughs> All right, Alexander II also the Trans-Siberian Railway is going to get started, and that's probably one of the more famous things you've you've probably heard of it before. Um, Trans-Siberian Railway is going to be an attempt to unite this gigantic country. Russia is a huge country, it goes all the way over here from Europe all the way to uh, the oceans out here in Asia, and so they want to unite it by building a giant railway. Also very important for Russia, Russia will do darn near anything in order to secure a warm water port, which is why they're going to try to build this city down here, Vladivostok. 
I want you to pay attention here. This area here seems to be really close to the border of Korea, and that's going to cause some issues later on. We're going to come back onto it. Also, if you notice, branches of it are going to move into Manchuria, this area, the head of the chicken, right? So Manchuria, and then into China. That will also cause some problems. Um, so this is a good attempt. It is going to try to unite the country, but it is going to run into some other problems. Uh, remember, Russia needs a warm water port. That's basically all of history in a nutshell. All right, so there's some reforms. You know, people are, you know, Tsar Alexander II, he's trying to make some reforms. Not hugely successful, uh, but he's trying his best here. They're trying to do something. Meanwhile, uh, intellectual development. Russia's got an interesting history here. So despite, or maybe even because of all the struggles Russia going on in Russia, their literacy rates skyrocket. I think at one point, um, Russia... Like Russian peasants had a higher literacy rate than uh, average like German citizens, um, which is mind blowing because the Russians were far poorer. Um, but some great poets and authors came out of this time period from Russia, and you've probably heard of like Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and Pushkin and people like Pushkin and people like that. Um, these are famous authors and poets uh, from Russia at this time period. And you know, I say despite or maybe because of the Russian struggles, it's it is kind of a true thing. Um, I wish it wasn't true, but it is sort of true that uh, struggle and uh, difficulty oftentimes creates some of the greatest art um, and some of the most creativity. Uh, humans can be very creative sometimes when struggling, and maybe Russia's struggles led to a lot of that. But anyways, a new class of people start to develop in Russia who are usually dirt poor, basically peasants themselves. I mean, if you see Tolstoy here, he's, he's not a... Uh, not living large here, right, obviously. But this new class of people who were usually very poor, uh, but incredibly well-educated, incredibly well-read, um, were called the intelligentsia. So this new gr group of people who were studying things, whatever they could get their hands on, whatever, you know, sometimes smuggled in, uh, not banned or anything, but they were uh, questioning things and challenging things uh, inside of Russia. So we're seeing a new group. It's almost like the bourgeois class of Western Europe, but these people... Uh, don't have the access to money. They don't have the capital uh, that the bourgeoisie do, but they do have a lot of the intelligence. New political concepts like uh, socialism and communism, we've already talked about those a little bit. There's going to be a new version of communism coming up here soon, we'll talk about. But uh, new political concepts also like anarchism. Uh, anarchism becomes very popular in Russia. Uh, anarchy, you've probably seen this sim symbol here, you know, that some edgy 13 year olds carved into a desk or a school book or something like that, the anarchy symbol. Anarchism is an interesting political philosophy where, you know, people in Russia were, you know, studying and very well educated and they start to say, hey, I think the problem is government, right? Government, the czars and how they're running our country and how they're controlling us, they're the problem. So if government's the problem, then maybe the solution is no government, right? You know, governments are not only not necessary, but are harmful and most highly immoral institutions. Uh, that's a quote from Tolstoy. Um, maybe that's a solution there. Now, uh, in reality, anarchism is hard to live by. Uh, Tolstoy, in his later life, became a Christian anarchist. He believed that, that you didn't need a government, you just needed uh, the laws of Christianity uh, to, to run a country. You know, that, these are hard things to live up to, though. But anarchism becomes very popular, and we'll talk more about anarchism uh, later on in this chapter, and also as it leads into, because anarchists will be involved with leading into World War One. Anarchists uh, and anarchism was sort of like the terrorism of the late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, if you wanted to come to the United States of America, one of the questions that was asked on your immigration forms is, are you an anarchist? I'm not making that up. That was a thing that they asked people. Um, because anarchism was kind of the boogeyman of this time period. If you were a government, obviously, you don't want people um, you know, preaching your destruction. But anyways, you said socialism, communism start to become more popular. Well, a lot of these intelligentsia people, you know, they're, they're coming up with ideas, they're questioning things, they're basically a threat to the government, and the Russian czars are going to institute a policy of uh, <laughs> exporting their problems. You know, England was sending prisoners originally to the American colonies and then Australia, uh, France had all sorts of prison islands. Well, Russia's going to do it in-house. Russia uh, starts to develop gulags, essentially, these uh, prison camps out in Siberia, sometimes negative 40-degree weather, if not colder, uh, god-awful living conditions where they would have people chop down trees or make gravel and do all sorts of terrible jobs and oftentimes freezing cold temperatures. And you've probably heard of gulags before because they're usually, you know, spoken in the same vein as, like, the concentration camps and, and uh, 
terrible labor camps of Nazi Germany. Stalin is also going to have his own labor camps, the gulags that he will use. Um, so the czars actually did this a hundred years before Stalin, you know, a hundred years before uh, forced labor camps in World War II era. So gulags have been around for a while, unfortunately, that the Russians were using them. The Russian czars. But you'll very famously hear about them uh, related to Stalin because he keeps the same idea, keeps using them, once again, for political activists. Uh, if you're going to be you know, speaking out against the government, this could be where you would end up. If you're ever interested, this is a great book. It's about One Day in the Life of Ivan Denosovich by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Um, great book. It's really short. It's really just one, guy, one guy's life, his daily life inside of a concentration camp, the experiences that he saw. Um, highly recommend it. It's a really short read. It's a great book if you're really curious about how terrible life in a gulag was. All right, so Russian reactionaries. <clears throat> So Alexander II is trying to make some reforms, okay? He's trying to change things. He's just not being super successful, right? He gives the serfs their freedoms, doesn't give them any money. He allows for some local government control, but they don't have any authority over the rest of the country. He builds this great railroad. It's going to cause some other problems. Um, anyways, so Alexander II is trying to make reforms, but he's not super successful. An anarchist group called the People's Will is going to blow him up. <laughs> like they, they blew him up. They, they, here's his carriage. They threw like a grenade, I think, underneath it, and he blows up and dies. And so while Alexander II was considered very liberal for a czar, like he was very change-oriented, he wanted to see changes in Russia, Alexander III, his son, comes into power and is totally different. And, and think about it from Alexander III's perspective. His father, Alexander II, was very open to reforms, and he wanted to change things, and he wanted to help people. And what did that get him? It got him dead. He got blown up. And so Alexander III comes to power, and he's like, hey, those liberal reforms, how'd that work out for you, Dad? Right? It didn't work out. And so I'm going to go the exact opposite way. Whereas Alexander II was all of trying to change things and westernize, even though he wasn't successful, Alexander III is going to come in and say, I'm going to crush anybody who might resist my will. He halted all liberalism, all liberal change reforms, incredibly strict control, went after all political groups, uh, really ramped up the attacks on Jewish people, the Jewish population, and this is where you start to see Jewish people flooding out of Russia in the uh, mid, uh, mid to late uh, 19th century, because at this point it was almost impossible uh, for Jewish people to live because he was scapegoating them. A lot of times Jewish people were wrapped up and accused of being anarchists and things like this. It was all just garbage uh, that would rally the Russian people against a common enemy, which in this case was other Russians, they just happened to be Jewish. And so they blamed the Jewish people as a scapegoat um, and started to attack these people. As a result, many Jewish people would flee. Uh, many people would start moving to the Palestinian region, you know, the, the area of the Ottoman Empire. So if you had some money, you might go buy land from the Ottomans in what is now going to be today Israel, Palestine area. Uh, of course, many other Russian Jewish people would flee and end up either in Europe or the United States of America. And to this day, a lot of the Jewish population of the United States of America is Russian descent. This is why. This is why. So Alexander III's uh, horrible pogroms. And he, they weren't just his pogroms, right? They had been around for a while. He really ramps it up, though. All right. So Alexander III is crushing any resistance. There's almost no reforms now in Russia. Um, you know, Alexander II tried and failed. Let's move on to the next guy. And you've probably seen his picture before, right? The bald, the bald head and the goatee stands out. And you've definitely seen this symbol before. So Bolshevism and Leninism rise. Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, I cannot pronounce that. Thank God he just goes by Lenin. <laughs> but Lenin comes on the scene. Um, he was a lawyer originally, uh, but he becomes very politically minded and politically active after his brother is arrested by secret police and hanged. And I guess, you know, that would work for anybody. So the government of Russia essentially becomes his enemy after they kill his brother. Now, he liked the idea of communism, and we talked about communism earlier on um, because it's an earlier idea. He liked the idea of communism uh, as put out by Karl Marx, but he had a problem. He had a problem with it. Remember, Karl Marx is German, and he was writing in England, and he was watching industrialization and the horrors of the Industrial Revolution, and Karl Marx said, hey, industrialization, this is causing problems. Eventually, it's going to lead to uh, workers, industrial workers, overthrowing the government and overthrowing the factories and taking control. Um, so that's, you know, that's it, what he viewed to be an, an inevitable part of history, industrial capitalism uh, leading to communism. Well, Lenin liked the idea of communism. He liked the idea of communal ownership, 
and he liked the idea of like no capitalist class and you know everybody working for the common good and all that stuff he liked that idea but he had a problem there's no capitalism in russia and there's no real industrialization in russia marx was very critical of farmers Marx believed that the peasant class, the farming class, had no class consciousness and that they weren't smart enough, essentially, to become communists and they weren't smart enough to overthrow the government. He, Marx said that you needed to have industrialization and capitalism before you could have communism. Well, Lenin looks at Russia and he's like, well, I want communism, but we don't have the stage. We don't have the step of capitalism and industrialization. We just don't have that. We have some factories, but most of Russia at this point is agricultural most of its farming people and so while marx looked at farmers as being stupid and worthless lenin says hey i've got an idea i'm gonna my end goal is communism like what marx wanted but i'm going to unite the two different types of workers right the small group of industrial workers that russia does have notice the hammer in the hammer and sickle here so he's going to unite the industrial workers with the agricultural workers represented by the sickle, right? The sickle that you would use to uh, harvest uh, wheat or some other grain crop. And so the hammer and the sickle become Lenin's symbol for Leninism, Bolshevism, or communism, his version of communism. A lot of people get this confused, and they think that Marxism and Leninism is all the same and stuff like that. It is not. Um, they are different ideas. Lenin and Marx probably would not have gotten along so much. They had the same end result. They wanted communism. They had the same end idea, but how they were going to get there was different. Karl Marx says you have to follow all these steps and stages, and that communism is going to happen in a country like England or Germany or the United States of America. Lenin's like, nah, we can skip over and how we're going to skip over this capitalism phase, how we're going to skip over the industrialization phase, we're going to involve the peasants, the agricultural workers. So how can we do that? Well, he kind of still believed with Marx that they weren't smart enough to do it on their own. They needed somebody to guide them. They needed somebody to tell them uh, how to become communists. And so that's where the Bolshevik party comes into play. The Bolsheviks are a political party, you know, like in the United States of America, we have like Republicans and Democrats and stuff like that. Well, they had Mensheviks and Bolsheviks, and I think there were other ones. I can't remember the rest of the names, but they had other political parties in, in uh, Russia at this time period. And the Bolsheviks are one of these groups. And they say that they can lead the peasant class to class, uh, the, the lowest, you know, the agricultural workers to class consciousness, to the understanding of, you know, how class works, essentially, and the different class levels that exist in society. Um uh as but they needed to have these bolsheviks be the vanguard the people leading them there and teaching them this stuff and dragging them along so essentially like the bolsheviks and the industrial workers would be guiding the uh agricultural workers and that is leninism or you might hear it sometimes referred to as bolshevism that's a political party so bolshevism leninism same idea so this is the idea that with the industrial workers and agricultural workers then you can have a communistic revolution the hammer and sickle then become the major like known symbol for communism uh, that is lenin's idea marx would not understand this symbol so karl marx would not understand what this symbol is about and he would uh disagree with it so just to put that out there so lenin's getting involved and he's starting to form his ideas his political party is getting formed up he'll have to flee russia after 1905 and we'll talk about what's going to happen in 1905 russia here in a little bit all right so Russia's, Russia's got all these internal problems going on. They're struggling to industrialize. Their country's got, you know, anarchists. And now increasingly, uh, this new group of new style communists are coming out. Uh, there's a lot of problems going on in Russia. So why not get involved with the war? Another war, right? That'll fix it, just like the Crimean War did. Uh, so despite all these internal struggles, Russia was still trying to involve itself with foreign affairs. In Eastern Europe, they viewed themselves as the big brother to all the uh, Slavic nations that bordered them. Uh, that's going to be a contributing factor to World War One and Russia's involvement in World War One. And meanwhile, over here in uh, Asia, we talked about this already, they were building this giant railroad, railroad the Trans-Siberian Railway. They were building this into China and then right up on the border of Korea. And this is going to cause a problem because Japan was taking more in Japan had fought a war with China, uh, and Japan had claimed a lot of this territory, especially dominion over Korea. And here's Russia, this European power, who thinks that they can just move in. And we haven't talked about Japan yet, and we'll get to how Japan changed and modernized and became a threat. But this is really one of the first times where Japan is going to step up and say that they are not some weak Asian power like everybody else assumed that uh, you know all the other countries were, or some other imperialized power or country. 
Japan is going to be, you know, they're, this is where they're going to step up. So the railroad moves into an area that the Japanese are basically claiming for themselves. There's a disagreement over this, and that's going to lead to war with Japan. The Russo-Japanese War, it's pretty short, all right? The Russo-Japanese War is a pretty short war, but um, Russia and Japan go to war over basically the Korean areas and where the railroad can be built and who owns the land. Eventually, American President Teddy Roosevelt will help them negotiate the peace treaty, but the actual war itself was bloody and terrible. Um, it is a World War I-style war, but 10 years before World War I. People fought in trenches, right? If you see here, you're like, well, that looks like World War I. If you've ever seen a picture or a movie from World War I, you say, well, that looks almost the same. Just Japanese soldiers and Russian soldiers. Um, it is. It's basically a miniature version of World War One, and the reason why they're in trenches is the same reason they use trenches in World War One, the new invention of machine guns. The Russo-Japanese War is one of the first main times that um, machine guns are used against machine guns. For most of the last, you know, units that we've talked about, the last, you know, few years, uh, we've talked about the British conquering Africa, and they use machine guns. The British were the only ones who had the machine guns. The African people didn't, right? When uh, other people conquered different parts of the world, when other Europeans or Americans conquered, they were the only ones with that technology. But now in the Russo-Japanese War, Russian machine guns went up against Japanese machine guns. Well, what did they have to do? Well, machine guns would tear you apart, right? And so they dug into trenches and they basically had to fight a defensive war. And machine guns killed by the hundreds of thousands sometimes. They were brutal, terrible weapons uh, to be used in war. And the traditional strategy was you would send your army, you would send your soldiers in a wave, the continental fighting style, against the machine guns, and they would just get chewed up. So the Russo-Japanese War is pretty br bloody and pretty brutal, and in the end result, Japan basically won. Japan humiliated Russia. This is the first time in history a European power was defeated by an Asian power. And Japan, a tiny island on the other side of the world who was for most of its history isolated and very remote, just went to war with one of the biggest European powers and beat them in war. It's a great moment for Japan. It's a terrible moment for Russia. This really brings down Russian morale. You know, they're already struggling with internal stuff, and now they lost against a tiny Asian country on the other side of the world. This is humiliating for Russia. So what's that going to lead to? Well, humiliating war was being lost. Terrible working and living conditions. Peasants in the nation were in massive debt, and no political or social rights. Most people in Russia just scraping by. Eventually, the ironworks in St. Petersburg are going to be shut down by an entire, uh, by basically an entire strike. So the entire you know, working staff of the ironworks, the people who made steel and such, shut down. They said, we're not going to work anymore for St. Petersburg. The government, in response, shut down the entire city. No lighting, no papers, nothing. Basically, just to like, make it a ghost town. They say, unless you go back to work, we're not turning, you know, the city life is dead. Meanwhile, a priest leads a march out of St. Petersburg. All right, and I think I have a picture of him. Here, here we go. A no Russian Orthodox priest leads a march. Oh, yeah, spoilers. Don't look at that. A Russian Orthodox priest leads a march out of St. Petersburg, and he marches to the Winter Palace of the Tsar. So Tsar Nicholas II, um, he's going to talk to him. All right. So this Russian priest, and he has all of these Russian peasants with him who are just regular people, they are going to the Russian Tsar to ask for help. And you have to understand, this seems like a weird concept for us because, you know, we live in the future now and, and we don't live in the feudal time periods. But if you're the czar, if you're a king and you had divine right, like if you got your authority to rule a country from God, in a weird way, you're a sort of a religious leader and a political leader. And then you're also sort of the father of the country, right? So this priest, who is a Russian Orthodox priest, went to Tsar Nicholas II as the leader of his country, but also the leader of his faith. And he said, hey, your people are suffering. Your people are struggling. We, it's not even just the political things. Like, we can barely survive. We can barely feed our families. We're losing this humiliating war against Japan. Um, our country's crumbling. But meanwhile, the your other European powers are surpassing us, and we're falling behind. You know, we need help. You need to do something. Well, here's the real kicker. Tsar Nicholas II wasn't even at the Winter Palace at this time period, um, but what was there was a whole bunch of guards. So there were a bunch of uh, soldiers who were guarding the Winter Palace, and they get out, and they are all very well armed. The mob, um, 
that was with this you know Russian priest who were just there they were praying uh, it was men women and children uh, they were unarmed they were going to beg essentially for the czar at, at the czar's feet czar is not there the guards are there and this is where things you know nobody knows for sure some people say maybe somebody threw a rock it could have been an accidental firing you know imagine you're a 17 18 year old guard and you get scared and you accidentally pull the trigger i don't know nobody really is 100 percent sure but what happens is what the guards open fire and it's a massacre these russian peasants are unarmed uh, they were going to beg you know for food and beg for help from the from their religious leader basically from their political and religious leaders are nicholas ii and in response what they got were bullets and so this event becomes bloody sunday and by the way there are a bunch of bloody sundays in history not this is not the one you two is singing about that's a different one uh but this is bloody sunday is re refers to russian history so anyways czar's not even there spook guards massacre thousands bloody sunday this is going to take russia by storm so not only are they losing this war and the country's following now it looks like the government is killing priests and men women and children you know unarmed men women and children who were just there to beg this is not a good moment for russia uh, at least not for the russian czar revolution of 1905 massive protests spread across the entire country as word of bloody sunday uh takes off um you see revolutions are basically uh, peasants go on strike and storming the streets and people refusing to work until things change so a major revolution starts taking place 1905 mostly led by socialist groups uh lenin's involved with this he'll he spoilers the revolution's going to fail but lenin will have to uh, flee after this one so um revolutions start taking place and the czar czar nicholas ii says okay all right fine all right i see that there's some problems going on let's start making some changes all right so he starts giving peasants freedom from uh, peasants freedom from their debts and he starts allowing for land ownerships and actually grants land to people uh what's going to develop is a new class of like they're still pretty poor but they're slightly less poor like lower middle class uh peasants they're called kulaks who will start to rise up these are pe russian peasants who can own small far farms uh, and they're sort of like a bourgeoisie class. They're not factory owners. They're not incredibly wealthy. Compared to any of like the European middle class, they would have been dirt poor. But they were better off than the poorer Russian peasants. So we do see, start to see some wealth uh, and some land ownership developing among non-lords, non-aristocratic -arist families anymore. Uh, he does create a parliament called the Duma. So the Duma is going to be like basically Russian for parliament. Um, and he creates his parliament and says okay you guys you know i'm going to step back i'll be the czar still uh but it's going to be more like england's government you know how england has a parliament and they make all the rules on taxes and they make all the rules on uh laws for the country and then the queen just signs off on it well it's going to be like that in russia that's what he tells people so he creates this parliament he creates the duma it's going to have elected officials it's going to have democracy and we're going to allow for like middle class people to rise up and everybody's like finally this is what we wanted and then he strips power from the duma so almost immediately the duma starts making decisions and he's like yeah i'm not that's not going to happen yeah no, i'm not going to sign off on any of this crap and so um removed the powers of the duma almost immediately it was all false he gave all these reforms just to get people back to work he gave these reforms just to end the revolution of 1905 and then he comes down and cracks the whip really hard on everybody um he gives them the false reforms gets the people back to work makes them shut up and then goes back to his own ways so he goes back to being an autocratic dictator russia's got some problems brewing they've got a lot of political ideas they've got internal their economies collapsing they're losing wars with other countries countries that like england and france would look at and still consider pretty weak um they're, they're able to beat those weak countries are able to beat russia in war this is a bad time and russia's obviously got some problems this is just before world war one and this is how russia is going to go into world war one a divided country that is struggling to keep up uh and is basically killing itself all right in the next video we'll get into japan